right. Well, we've given it a few minutes. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, all right. Thank you all for joining. Uh, my name is Liz Paglia, for those of you who don't know me. Uh, with us today, we have Susan Weirman. Uh, Susan has 45 years of experience in air quality management. She's been a lecturer for EP since 2017, when she retired after 20, 21 years as executive director of the Mid-Atlantic Regional Air Management Association, which provides training, technical services, and coordination to 10 state and local air quality agencies. Before joining Marma, she served for eight years as the Deputy Director of Maryland's Air Management Administration. She has a Master's in BA in Urban Planning from the University of Washington and a Certificate in Continuing Engineering, Engineering Studies from Johns Hopkins. The Air and Waste Management Association and International Professional Association awarded her their 2012 Griswold Award for Outstanding Pollution Control. Thank you so much for joining us today, Susan. Uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Liz. Good morning or good afternoon, and thank you very much for joining. I'm pleased to have a chance to share with you some highlights from the course that I teach with Dr. Mike Robert on principles of air quality management. I'll tell you a little bit about this picture if we have time at the end, but let's just move on and, and also thank Hedy Alavi, who's our department chair and gave us the opportunity to redevelop this class, which we offered for the first time last fall and will offer again next fall. It was based on a course that we had done previously with the help of Alicia Magruder and then Osmara Salas helped us with this one in which was very great. The um, Johns Hopkins Center for Leader um, Learning and Design Tech and Technology, I'll get that mixed up, but anyway, these, this is, we have great technical support and instructional design support. So today I hope that you'll learn if you don't already recognize that air pollution is an important public health issue and will identify air quality management as an ongoing process and help you apply some lessons from how we made progress in the past to issues that are current now and cultivate your interest in learning more. So let's get started. Asthma is one of the current problems that's exacerbated by air pollution. And air pollution doesn't necessarily cause asthma, but it can make it worse. And adults and children with asthma are more likely to have symptoms when ozone or fine particle pollution are in the air that they breathe. Exposure matters. And we think of that in terms of the concentration of pollution in the air and the time that a person is exposed. And their individual characteristics also matter in terms of how they are going to respond to that. This little diagram, is a, an EPA view of the fact that more people are exposed to concentrations of pollution that don't have really serious effects, but some people, a smaller number, are exposed and have the most serious effects, including earlier death and emergency department visits, hospital admissions, doctor visits. But even a lot more people may have some symptoms respiratory issues, lung function decrements, susceptibility to infection. Those with the greatest exposure to outdoor air pollution are people exercising heavily outdoors for long periods. Children are the most vulnerable because their lungs are just developing and older people. This is a cover of a book that was written about one of the famous air pollution episodes that we discuss in the class, the fifth, 20, uh, 1952 episode of the Great London Smog. Smog had been happening in London for many, many years, and it wasn't new to them. But this was after World War II, and they were struggling to, to rebuild the city after all the damage that occurred in World War II. And when Kate Dawson went to do research in the newspapers there in London, as she was writing this book, she found that much of the newspaper coverage was taken up by coverage of a serial killer that was on the loose and that they were having trouble finding. So her book turned into a murder mystery as well as a really interesting and, and useful story of how the people dealt with air pollution in that time. One of the things I remember was that she actually got to interview a woman who was a teenager at that time and whose father died because of that smog. Some of the other famous episodes are the 1931 episode in the Meuse Valley in Belgium, 1948 in Denora, 
1984 in Bhopal, India. Thousands of people died in these episodes. And this may seem to students nowadays as a long time ago. My mother was probably in college um, in 1931. And the 1948 and 1952 timeframe are when people in my generation of the baby boom were being born. And so, yes, it's a long time ago, and we should have learned a lot of lessons by then. So why did we still have problems in 1984? That was an American company located in Bhopal, India, that had an, uh, an accidental release of a very, very toxic gas that killed thousands of people right away and even tens of thousands over the coming years when they still felt the effects because air pollution can affect you even after you've been back in the clean air part and um, everyone is part of the problem. Not so much now as they were back in London in 52 when they were all burning coal in their homes, but even now we burn uh, fossil fuels in our homes, some of us. Air pollution is known as a silent killer we don't necessarily taste and feel and smell it anymore, but there are still people dying early because of exposure to air pollution. And the purpose of air quality management is to restore and protect air quality so that it's self to, safe to breathe and supports a healthy ecosystem. But why is it hard to do that? Why have we had so much trouble with it even now? Well, there's a lot of reasons. Um, even some air pollutants come from nature and everyday human activities that people don't want to stop doing. Atmospheric chemistry is difficult to model. The, the pollutants react with each other in the air as they travel downwind. And even then, emissions are uncertain. So how much pollution is there and where did it come from? Acceptable levels keep getting smaller as science keeps telling us, well, we've found that even smaller levels of air pollution in the air can have health effects. And there are synergistic effects of multiple pollutants that we're still not sure about. Pollutant transport crosses political boundaries, which means cooperation and collaboration are necessary to resolve it. And that's not always forthcoming because it's expensive and sometimes disruptive to control that pollution. But political support and public support that drives that political support are needed in order for an effective air pollution control program to succeed. I want to tell you about one that happened in St. Louis back in the early part of the 20th century. This is called Commons, Common Fields and Environmental History of St. Louis. And it's a book that was published by the Missouri Historical Society in 1997 edited by Andrew Hurley. And the chapter that's about air pollution is called The Struggle for Smoke Control in St. Louis. It was written by Professor Joel Tarr and Dr. Carl Zimring, who was one of Dr. Tarr's students at Carnegie Mellon University. It's a great book. I'd like you to learn several things from the stories about this that I'll tell you. It took a long time to get at controls of air pollution in St. Louis, but it was one of the first places in the US that was successful in doing that. It took a lot of public pressure, laws had to change, enforcement authority had to be clarified, actions had to be taken, and the government actually supported some costs to make it easier on people. In 1893, St. Louis adopted their first control, a smoke control ordinance, but it really wasn't very successful People were angered by it and they challenged it. And not too long after it was adopted, it was ruled unconstitutional by the state Supreme Court. So why was that? Well, in the constitution, there's nothing that talks about air pollution or environmental control. In fact, the power to protect the public health and to control pollution is part of the police power, which is one of the powers that's reserved to the states. It's not given by the constitution to Congress or to the president. So in early 1900s, state law finally was changed in Missouri to give St. Louis the power to pass ordinances to limit smoke pollution. And they did that, but it really wasn't very successful because they didn't really hire anybody to go out there and enforce those laws. There, there were people who cared about it and they formed a citizens smoke abatement league, 
and undertook a major public education effort trying to get people on a voluntary basis to not make so much smoke. But it really was a problem that was endemic in the society. This is a picture of downtown St. Louis in the 1930s. And at that time, people were often burning coal in their homes, in their businesses, in the boilers that heated, provided heat and power to these growing cities. And people didn't want to spend the money to switch away from coal. It was expensive to do that. And there was a lot of opposition. It's kind of like what we're say, seeing nowadays with the move to try to get us to move away from burning fossil fuels in our homes. We may have an oil boiler or we may have a, a gas boiler in our home, or we may have electricity. And sometimes if you have a boiler that circulates hot water in your home for heating, it's going to cost a lot of money and a great disruption to replace that with electric heat. So people aren't that anxious to go out and spend that kind of money. Voluntary measures aren't going to get us all the way there that we need to go even now. So in 1937, the city passed more ordinances and they actually started trying to enforce them. And in 1940, they strengthened them again requiring cleaner fuel and better fuel burning equipment. And they then negotiated lower costs for coal. But eventually cities like St. Louis had to ban the use of solid fuel such as coal or even wood in home heating in order to really get at the smoke. So why did we need the Clean Air Act if we had all this control at the state and local level? It really wasn't working everywhere. In 1970, according to this training document for lawyers, Congress amended the Clean Air Act in response to the perceived failure of state and local governments to control pollution when aided by only the most minimal federal assistance. There was assistance being provided by the Department of Health, Education and Welfare and the US Public Health Service to states and cities. They were training them on what they knew about how to control air pollution, but they weren't backing it up with federal law. And in 1970, the businesses such as the manufacturers of automobiles decided they were not sure they wanted every single state in the union to pass their own laws about what kinds of autos had to be manufactured to control pollution and automobiles were getting to be a really big source of pollution. So the Congress acted. They've established some, of find, some findings on which to base their law. They said air pollution is getting worse. It's a danger to public health and welfare. They said federal assistance isn't enough right now. They did point out that control and prevention of air pollution is the primary responsibility of state and local governments. But they also pointed out that metropolitan areas cross local and state lines. So this led them to the fact that they had a scientific basis for the act because of the health and welfare damage. They had an economic basis because the externalities of smoke, the adverse effect on the people who weren't causing that smoke, wouldn't be addressed without enforcing legal requirements. And they had a legal basis because the Constitution gives Congress the power to regulate interstate commerce and demands equal protection of the law. So the, they had coal fired trains crossing state lines. They had places like St. Louis that are located right on state borders, causing pollution in other states. They had justification for the law. And it's been amended significantly in the 77 amendments, in the 1990 amendments. But basically, this cycle of the air quality management process is relatively consistent throughout that time. We establish goals, determine emission reductions that are necessary to meet those goals, develop control strategies and technologies to implement the reductions, go ahead with the programs, and then check, did, they make, did we make it? Did we achieve what we were trying to do? And what does science tell us that we need to do now? So it's a cycle. It's not a start now and stop later. It's a cycle. And it involves a lot of scientific research. 
EPA also recognizes the importance of keeping the public informed. And this is an example of um, the airnow.gov website where you can go and find out what the air quality is like in your community and what it's going to be like in, in the coming day or days. And it is helpful, especially to places that have things like forest fires that really get them down into the unhealthy and very unhealthy range. For the most part, we're in the moderate or maybe unhealthy for sensitive groups, which, is, which means we're above the standard, but we're not really highly um, dangerous situation. So we should look for those days that are good air quality. Here's an example of some of the important science that has driven work in the most recent years to control air pollution. In 2003, Jim Galloway and other prominent researchers published a paper about the nitrogen cascade, which begins with um, combustion and chemical processes that convert the nitrogen that's naturally in the air in the form of N2 into forms that are accessible to animals and people and plants. They, they combust the, the air as part of burning fossil fuels and it forms NOx, which is an air pollutant. And they uh, make ammonia, which is converted to synthetic fertilizer. And all of this new nitrogen then enters the cycle of the nitrogen cascade, which causes uh, nitrogen to create particulate matter pollution. It creates ozone pollution. It, it's applied to the land, which can, if it's done in too great an extent, give us well water that is uh, unhealthy to drink. It leaches into the rivers and lakes and comes down in air uh, from the air in acid rain and then cycles back up into the air as greenhouse gases are formed and that goes up into the stratosphere and helps destroy the ozone layer. So it doesn't disappear naturally, it just keeps cycling. The nitrogen cycle is way out of whack from what it would be naturally. And this is a problem as significant really as the carbon cycle. Here's an example that um, shows that nitrogen pollution can drop if we stopped burning, burning fossil fuels, but it of course has significant negative consequences when that happens. This is a satellite view of China in 2020 in the first two months of the COVID epidemic when they shut down a lot of activity. And you can see that the, the nitrogen basically disappeared. There are other means to do that that don't cause such disruption, although they do have costs. This is a picture of one of the big power plants that's located in Tennessee. It's the TVA Kingston fossil plant on the Clinch River. And I took this picture last December from the freeway going by. It was built in the 1950s and the stacks, the smokestacks on the right are what were used when it was first built. But then it was recognized that pollution controls were needed, that maybe they should burn low sulfur fuel, maybe they should put up taller stacks so that the pollution would be more diluted when it came down to the ground. This happened in the 70s, but it was finally realized that dilution is not the solution to pollution, it just pushes it a little further away. And that acid rain was from coming from all that sulfur. So they had to add scrubbers and they had to try to figure out how to control nitrogen. And they finally did that in the 2000s. And I'll show you a, jet, a graph that comes from the TVA website of what happened to the pollution from 1974 to about 2019. There are three different y-axis for the different pollutants that are shown here. SO2 is in the blue, NOx is in the red, and carbon dioxide is in the green. It wasn't measured as long ago as the other two pollutants. And you see a drop that it drops precipitously in about 2008. That was not because CO2 was controlled at this plant. That was because they had a huge problem. They had been taking particles out of the emissions stream to control the particulate pollution. And that created ash in a slurry and they stored that in a pond and the dam broke. 
and they had a tremendous water pollution problem downstream and they had to really shut down part of the plant in order to deal with that problem. And that meant that the CO2 came down. There aren't pollution controls that are applied to reduce that CO2. It means that they were making less power. But the SO2 came down much earlier in the 70s. They, they switched fuels, they burned lower sulfur coal, they added a scrubber, some scrubbers on, and the NOx kept moving along some variation, but still pretty high until the 1990s when it started coming down and then dropped significantly by the end of the 1990s and around the 2005 timeframe. And I'm gonna show you a, a couple of satellite views between 2005 and 2011. This plant wasn't the only one that was applying nitri nitrogen con controls at that time. And other plants either applied controls or if they didn't want to pay the cost to apply those nitrogen controls, some of them shut down either in whole or in part. And so we saw a tremendous drop in nitrogen all over the Eastern US. This is what it looked like in 2005. And the, the red in Eastern Tennessee on the west side of the Allegheny Mountains there, uh, Shenandoah Mountains shows where the, the Clinch River plant was, the TVA plant. And you can see what happened by 2011 there were requirements for NOx pollution to be controlled. It was a big fight to get them on the books and to get them enforced and in place because people couldn't believe for a long time that nitrogen was really causing problems. They thought, well, it's just fertilizer coming freely from the sky. Why, why should we be concerned about that part of the nitrogen that comes down in the rain? But of course, it was also causing ozone pollution and acid rain and eutrophication of coastal waterways. So there were problems and there were reasons to bring it down. Air quality has improved substantially, not just nitrogen, but also particulate matter, sulfur dioxide and ozone pollution. They've come down and EPA studied the benefits that they could quantify from all these um, avoidance of health problems due to those pollution controls. And they compared that to the cost of the pollution controls. And they concluded in a report on the benefits and cost of the Clean Air Act from 1990 to 2020, that the benefits far, ex out far exceeded the costs. But we do still have pl uh, plenty of challenges. One of those is greenhouse gases. We, we have a lot of work to do on that. There was a major milestone in controlling greenhouse gases in 2009 when EPA Administrator Lisa Jackson in the Obama administration made two major findings. She found that greenhouse gases were endangering public health of current and future generations as well as public welfare. And she found that the emissions from new motor vehicles and new motor vehicle engines were contributing to this pollution, which threatened public health and welfare. And these two findings were challenged and they made it all the way through the Supreme Court. And they provide the foundation for EPA to join California in controlling greenhouse gases from motor vehicles. They did that and they were, um, they, uh, the, the uh, manufacturers were starting to implement those controls. And then of course the Trump administration came in and we saw some relaxation of the controls, but those have been uh, re-adopted and strengthened under the Biden administration. So we are making progress on greenhouse gas emissions from motor vehicles. Once a pollutant is determined to endanger the public health and welfare in one part of the Clean Air Act, this one is the part that deals with motor vehicle controls, it also becomes a pollutant that should be regulated in other parts of the act. And the Obama administration started the process of doing that, which again was challenged in the Trump administration and their rules were um, repealed. Um, and there has been a great deal of progress because of other controls and other requirements and because of the economics that is there regardless of the rules that are, that's pushing for more pollution control of greenhouse gases 
and the public concern is pushing that direction too. But the Biden administration is still working on trying to get back additional controls on some other sources. In the meantime, they have proposed stronger controls on particulate matter. And this is a map that shows you what would happen and what areas might violate those new standards if they are adopted. They are proposing to drop the level of the annual standard from 12 micrograms per cubic meter down to either nine or 10 micrograms per cubic meter. And the dark green areas would be areas that based on the air quality in the 19, 2019 to 2021 period would violate that standard. A lot of them you can see are out in the Western areas that were affected by wildfires. So there will be some different situations there in terms of what can be done to address those violations. And then there are the lighter green areas that would violate the nine micrograms per cubic meter standard based on that three year period. So this will be a very interesting area of work for the next few years. It's very likely that a standard will be strengthened and that there will be work needed to be done to implement those standards. Other studies have been done that find problems that need to be addressed. This is an example from Portland, Oregon, where the Forest Service did a study of the moss on trees. And the little red dots are the places where they sampled and they found high concentrations of um, heavy metals. And this was traced back to the production of art glass in small businesses that were not regulated by federal regulations. And the neighbors in those neighborhoods got very upset and blamed it all on the environmental people for the state agency. And the, and the uh, head of the state environmental agency ended up resigning as did the air director. So all kinds of things can happen when science recognizes a problem that people haven't known existed, but they get very upset about. Here's another example from North Carolina. This is a company that was producing Gen X, which was a substitute for Teflon when Teflon was determined to be causing public health problems. And it turns out that this type of uh, material is what they call a forever chemical. It's a PFAS. And it's not regulated by EPA or by the states generally. It hasn't been. And the state of North Carolina had to step in and figure out what to do about it because it was found in drinking water downstream. It was then found in well water near the plant. And eventually they determined that this pattern that they see in this um, picture here indicated that the well water problems might be coming from the deposition of rainfall that was contaminated due to emissions from the smokestack at the plant. So they, they had a lot of work to do. There were no standards. There was no indication of how to measure this stuff. There was no indication of what a safe level was. It was a lot of work for the state epidemiologists in the health department and the environment department. And of course they got advice from the federal agencies as much as they could, but states all over the country now have been working on these kinds of problems and EPA is working on them as well. And a lot of progress has been made. The state uh, required pollution control equipment to be installed and they're working still to make sure that the groundwater is cleaning up and that uh, they're not causing additional problems, but it, it's a long, long road to hoe. This is a picture of an EPA administrator, Michael Reagan, or Regan, and he was the head of the state environmental agency in North Carolina when that problem came to light. So it's good that he's now at the head of EPA because I think he'll have that kind of problem in the forefront of his mind. At the EPA strategic plan, there are a number of goals that relate to air quality. They relate to climate, environmental justice, making sure that laws are enforced and complied with, and that communities all over the country have clean and healthy air. One of the points I try to make to my classes is that it's not just technical knowledge. You have to have 
loss, you have to have people supporting you, and you have to be able to communicate with people who are not necessarily technically um, in your field. And it is a, a problem that requires a lot of collaboration. Scientists and engineers and other people have to work together. It's a team effort and it involves public interest groups, elected and appointed officials, source owners and operators, and it can take years to make sure that the laws are where they need to be and that we have the associated policies, plans, and regulations that we need. So work has to continue. We still have climate change to work on. We still have air toxics to deal with. And even the changes in the current standards for more common pollutants will pose challenges. And there's a lot of work to be done. So we need people to be educated in this field. But when you start working in air quality management, you can be overwhelmed by the number of technologies and acronyms and pollutants and laws and rules, and it can be quite confusing. So we try to sort that out at a basic level in the class that we teach. We talk about some principles and pollutants and the programs that address those pollutants within the principles of air quality management. We organize the class around the major pollutants and then bring in the programs that apply to them and show how those uh, relate to the principles underlying the programs. I guess some key points I'd like you to remember. Air pollution is an important public health problem, both locally and globally. The air quality management cycle is centered on science. It's a cycle. It doesn't just start and stop. It requires ongoing assessment and looking at what's new in science, and it requires leadership and public support. We've made a lot of progress, and there's a lot more to be done. As individuals, we can reduce our own contributions to air pollution. I may not have mentioned it at the time, but one of the biggest ways that EPA's regulation of motor vehicles is reducing greenhouse gas emissions is by increasing the miles per gallon that we get when we drive a car. If you're gonna buy a new car, pay attention to what the mileage is because it, it really does cut back on air pollution if you're getting better mileage. Learning about the principles of air quality management can help scientists and engineers work together with others, with lawyers, with public officials, with the general public, and address these multimedia issues across program areas. This is the class that we teach. Um, Dr. Robert and I would welcome having students registered next fall for this class. There are some other classes that um, really support this. There's a class in air pollution control that focuses more on the technologies. There's a class in um, uh, the air, air um, how the air quality is, is how the atmosphere affects air quality, uh, atmospheric chemistry. And there is a class, I believe, in um, environmental justice and, and in communication of environmental programs. All of these are important and can formulate a good program that prepares you. And this is just part of what you need to know. So thank you very much. And I'll look forward to any questions. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, so as you know, we've, we have a few questions that were submitted before uh, we started today. Um, for anybody who might have questions after watching or you know after seeing this presentation just now, um, you can either raise your hand if you'd like um, using the, the controls uh, or you can type in the chat and we'll be sure to read that to Susan. Um, and I'll kick things off with these questions that we've already received. Um, so one of the questions we got was, are you familiar with the solar radiative management approach to climate change in solar geoengineering covered in the NAS? Well, um, I'm not very familiar with it, but I did see that question in advance. So I pulled up, this is the National Academy of Engineering, Science, Engineering and Medicine. Uh, it's called Reflecting Sunlight. And it talks about what kind of research is needed. Geoengineering is something that can take a couple of different forms. It's trying to block 
the sun as it comes in before it gets through the stratosphere to get to the surface in an effort to cool off the planet. But there's um, a lot of questions that have yet to be answered about it. And one of the quotes I like that comes from a NASA engineer at, at the JPL, geoengineering is not a cure. At best, it's a Band-Aid or a tourniquet. At worst, it could be a self-inflicted wound. So it's not something that we can rely on. It's, uh, it's science that is uh, Work, people are working on, but it's not there yet. Great. Um, the next question we got is is a little bit of a question, kind of a, a, a general screaming into the void, I think. Uh, why does the average uh, American person not really care about air pollution, i.e. it is what it is, and they just live with it? I know you touched on that a little bit in your presentation, but if you sort of want to mm -hmm. give another response. Yeah, I think it's important to recognize that when we're driving our cars and when we're burning things, I mean, if you if you like having a barbecue out in your backyard, you're making air pollution and uh, your neighbors can smell that. And so uh, think about it. Think about what you're doing and how you can, in your own life, uh, work to reduce that pollution. And the last question that we uh, received before the presentation is, what do you feel is the largest unanswered challenge in ensuring good air quality for everyone? So, <laughs> you know, small, small question there. Well, I th <laughs> small I scale. Think, yeah, I think probably uh, climate change is, is really what is driving a lot of work right now. But nitrogen pollution is still an issue. And there are these unknown things that crop up from time to time. The PFAS is an important one. It's not just an air problem. It's a problem of how do we use chemicals and what do we use them for? And do we know what we're doing when we're using them? So it's something, it's, an, it's a process. We have to recall that science is, is a continuing process. We're gonna learn more. We know more now than we knew when we were children we know more, our children will know more than we know. And we just have to keep pushing ahead and be persistent. Absolutely. Okay, so that, that takes care of the questions that we uh, already received. If anybody else in um, who's attending wants to use uh, the Q&A functions or the chat or uh, use the control to raise your hand, you're welcome to ask a question as well. Okay, I've got somebody who raised uh, their hand. Uh, Deborah, I'm gonna click allow to talk. So it'll it'll allow you to use your microphone and, and unmute. Hi, Debbie. You can also uh, use the chat if you'd like, but I did click ask to unmute. So hopefully it'll- I, I, I'm sorry, I had a-, I had a There we go. <laughs> We've got um, you. Susan, that was, an, that was a really excellent presentation and, and so much good information. Um, I've always been curious, I don't know if you have any thoughts on what it's gonna take to get PFAS regulated. Um, it seems like we've already established that it's a very serious problem. Um, and I know there have been some attempts to, to bar these chemicals from coming into the country and being used in processes, but do you have any thoughts on, on the future of regulation of the forever chemicals? Well, I think it's probably something that's uh, gonna be addressed at the national level by uh, setting a water quality standard. But I think in order to implement that standard, it's gonna take a lot of work to figure out where it's coming from and deal with the pollution of the groundwater that's already there because of the firefighting foam that's on the ground or that came was, was disposed of on the ground at some points in time and, and the things, who knows what's coming out of landfills right now. Um, and it's also an air pollution problem. And there are a multitude of PFAS substances. So I think that work is going on to figure out how toxic are they? What kinds of effects do they have? How long do they stay in the body? Um, it, it's being addressed from multiple directions by science and by 
people trying to remediate problems that already have occurred in the past. So I, all I can say is there's a lot of work to do. Um, there have been things in the past where certain chemicals have been banned because they affect the stratospheric ozone levels, for example. Um, and there may, and there've been certain PFAS substances that have been banned in the past, but I'm not sure how many of them in addition will be banned or whether they will be restricted somehow. I think it's an open question right now. Yeah, thank you. I can see how enforcement would be a big issue too. Um, mm -hmm. The regulation would be very difficult. Yeah. While we're waiting, in case there are any other questions, let me tell you a little story about this picture that I used at the beginning. This is a picture that my husband took of me on our vacation in Canada, spending time looking at a source of air pollution instead of looking at the river that we were there to look at. This is the reversing falls on the St. John's River in uh, New Brunswick. And it's a, a very interesting place geologically because there are rocks around there that were once connected to what became Africa and what became uh, Antarctica. So it's a, a geopark designated by UNESCO. And it's just a fantastic place that you can also see air pollution coming out at two different levels from these stacks. And it's a, an illustration of something that I've seen in textbooks, but I hadn't seen actually in person, despite the fact that whenever we go on vacation, I'm out there taking pictures of air pollution sources. And the, the wind is blowing different directions at different heights. And so one stack is a little bit lower than the other and maybe discharging at a lower temperature. So it doesn't punch through the, the, the air is high and it goes off in one direction and the other one is a taller stack and a hotter temperature probably and rises up higher above the mixing height and it goes the other way. So th this is the kind of thing that makes it difficult to model air pollution and where it comes from. And you have to have information about the stack height and the emission temperature and the kind of pollution that's coming out. And you try to measure that and it, you get an average measurement at different points in time. So just figuring out what the emissions are is an interesting engineering problem. All right, thank you for that. Um, I haven't seen any other questions come in, so I'll sort of just give it one last time. And then if not, I think we might just uh, wrap up and, and thank you for your time so much today. Uh, it, was, it was very enlightening to hear about all of this. Um, did Is there anything else that you wanted to say before we sort no. of sign off? Okay. I hope you'll uh, either sign up for the class or recommend it to your students and think about how this class can fit with other classes in the program. Thanks for joining. Great. Thank you so much.